If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good, and today we're so honored to have a new guest on from a new country. We've got Roberto Sarrias from Puerto Rico on today, and Roberto is going to be speaking about Don Q. Rum. He's the Vice President of Business Development. He's also an American-educated PhD, so he's Dr. Sarrias. Welcome to Green is Good, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. He, you know, you are uh, your family story and what you're doing at Don Q Rum is truly amazing. And I don't want to give it away. I want you to explain it in your own words. But let me just say this to our listeners. Roberto, you are a sixth generation rum maker and you're taking you're taking your family business and you're transforming it. Talk a little bit about coming to America, the education you have, and the whole journey you've been on with your amazing brand, Don Q Rum. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for the opportunity, John. Yeah, it's been quite a very interesting uh, very interesting time. I, uh, I, I did, as you say, I did my undergraduate work at Brown University, and then out of there, my first job out of college, believe it or not, was teaching environmental education to public school kids in Vermont. Wow. And I did that for a couple of years, and that's where you, when you distill down, and, and the pun is intended, when you distill down environmental <laughs> issues to fifth and sixth graders, you start getting it, you know, in your real heart, like how simple some of these things are. So from there, I decided, you know, I want to teach college, so I went and got a Ph.D. at the University of Oregon um, in environmental sciences. And then as I'm just writing my dissertation, um, my family business is uh, Don Q. Rum, which is, by the way, the um, preferred rum in Puerto Rico. You can, if there's any listeners out there that are actually uh, Puerto Rican, you can attest to the fact that if anybody asks a Puerto Rican, so what's, what's the best rum in Puerto Rico? They'll say Don Q, because we are kind of like the national product down here. Got it. We sell way more than, you know, Bacardi at a higher price, but so it's kind of like the national, national product of Puerto Rico. But anyway, the, the, the whole thing started, basically. I'm writing my dissertation, and we have a, a, a very cool, hardcore environmental issue at the distillery, and the old man called me and said, hey, Roberto, I need, I need some help. But I never thought I'd work at the, in the family business. Uh, even though I'm a sixth generation rum maker, uh, I actually was. I came in at, kind of through the back door. <laughs> that is so interesting. So, how many years ago did you make the transition from educator to rum maker? Yeah, that was about seven years ago now. And uh, the problem the family has, and actually all rum distillers around the world, is a little sure. known fact. But most rum distillers, not all of them, actually uh, the wastewater that's dumped that's from the rum making process, yeah. uh, most rum makers actually dump it in the ocean or dump it in in fields, sugarcane fields. Now in Puerto Rico, there's no longer any sugarcane, even though there was when I was growing up. It's just we just couldn't compete uh, with other uh, other markets. So you know the sugar industry died in Puerto Rico. So it was, there was this issue. We 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 would put it in fields, but if it rained, the fields would get flooded, and then you had to stop production because your permit only allowed you to you know you couldn't. Uh, exceed the capacity of the field, so it was a, it was one of those issues where it was a capacity issue, but it was also an environmental issue. So my whole point was, well, you know, here's a byproduct, here's a waste product. What can we get out of it? What can we what can we do with it to turn it? So we uh, through I, I started researching all this sort of uh, what, what the other industries do, and basically because there's no there was nobody in the rum industry doing anything kind of like this, so. The brewers, you know, Anheuser Busch and other companies like that, they do anaerobic decomposition of their wastewater. In other words, anaerobic decomposition bacteria in the absence of oxygen produce, um, you know, as they eat up the organic material in the wastewater, they produce methane gas. And the methane gas has a lot of BTUs, so you can clean it up, you know, scrub it, and use it in your boiler uh, for energy. So I was like, wow, okay, let's see if we can apply that to, to our wastewater, which is very, very rich in organic uh, material. So that's how it kind of all started, um, basically trying to figure out what to do with our wastewater and what kind of benefits we can do. So it's worked so well that actually uh, fully operational, we um, displace about 50% of the oil we used to use with our, in our boiler from our own what we call biogas, with our own um, sort of methane gas that we produce as we clean up our wastewater. So it's a classic sort of wastewater energy project. Well, you know what's amazing too is is you're talking about replacing fifty percent of it to fuel your operation there. You're also saving more than that. The multiple is the production that you're saving on producing the oil, extracting it, producing it, refining it, and then transporting it there to your facility. So that's a huge savings. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like you know producing something locally, and this is ultimate local production. I mean, we produce it right at the facility. 
the gas we use to fire. And then, you know, uh, you know, you can throw on top of that the geopolitical costs, you know, which we're all very aware of, and I don't need to get into that, but also yeah. all of that, you know. Sourcing locally from your own wastewater is, is the ultimate sort of win-win situation. So at the end of the day, what we do is we do this anaerobic process. We reduce there probably about 70% of the organic material, you know, what's called BOD in the wastewater. And then we do a secondary step because that wasn't enough. So we had to make this water be irrigation-grade water because, you know, we're in the south coast of Puerto Rico. It's dry, so there's got to be some use for it. Um, so basically we started with 20,000 units of organic material, and we end up, after the aerobic part, with only 150. Uh, so it's, that, it's like a 99%, you know, or 99% reduction in the organic material in it. Um, and if I can just expand a little bit better, what makes me most proud is not only all of that, which was, you know, a very leap, steep learning curve and a lot of problems along the way, but uh, wastewater treatment produces sludges along the way. There's basically, you know, spent inorganics that come into molasses, all that kind of stuff, and dead bacteria, et cetera. So we dewater those sludges. Instead of, they most usually end up at, at landfills or something. We dewater them and mix them with old wood pallets and old barrels and stuff, wood chip, and we make an industrial compost out of it. So the idea is that there is a complete closed circle. Um, you know, the concept we're trying to follow here is, uh, you know, it's a, it comes out of, uh, there's a professor out of uh, Yale School of Forestry, um, Marion Chartow, is this whole concept of industrial ecology. In ecology, there is no waste. Uh, you know, everything, you know, the leaves that fall on the ground become, you know, um, you know, uh, source of nutrients for the plants, et cetera, et cetera. So industry, in order to be sustainable, we need to kind of adopt those kind of principles. So that's sort of the guiding light behind all this. I'm telling you, it hasn't been easy. There's still a few kinks in the system, but we're getting close. Well, you know, uh, for your, our listeners out there, if you have your laptop or iPad or desktop in front of you, please look at Roberto's amazing site, www.donq.rum. Uh, dot, no, Don Q. Dot com. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Wait a second. I like what's how you're thinking, John. Wait a second. I think I'm actually drinking the samples, uh, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> I kept them to myself. I don't know. So, and um, we're on the site right now, and I'm actually so drawn in to what you're what you've done with your beautiful site here, DonQ.com. I'm on the sustainability section, and please, if you've got your any of your laptops or iPads open, Roberto, you've done an amazing job here uh, under the sustainability. Sustainability section. The, the title is a clean finish. The Don Q rum in your glass is renowned for its clean finish. The way we make rum has a clean finish too. And everything you taught your, your your headlines are all about win-win solutions. Please talk about some of the other win-win solutions you've cre- created here because you you've really not only do you talk a great talk, Roberto, but this is just by the visuals and how you've laid out the sustainability section, literally how you've mapped this out and architected this, you actually, the walk is so transparent on your family's brand. It's, it's, it's beautiful. So please walk us through the other layers of sustainability here that you've created in the last seven years uh, at your uh, wonderful brand, Don Q Rum. Yeah, well, um, let's see. So, you know, it's, it all starts at the beginning because, I mean, what's funny about, you know, the way rum is made as opposed to other spirits is that the raw material of, 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 uh, of making rum is molasses, which is already the sugar industry's waste product. And, in fact, that's how we actually got in the rum business. We were originally in the sugar business. And, you know, it's like, hey, what do you do with those molasses? You know, well, you know, there's only enough cows you can feed it to. Um, so I hear if you ferment it, you can make rum. So that's, so you're already starting reusing a, a waste product, that's, and that's what rum is really about. Um, along the way, when you ferment, um, you know, the uh, yeast, what they expire is CO2. So we collect the CO2, we scrub it, and we sell it for soda pop, in, uh, you know, for local soda pop here on the island. Uh, so that's one of the steps we do. We, um, you know, the, uh, as I told you, the biogas we use for generating electricity and for generating steam for our, for our boiler and reducing our, our oil consumption. We consume over 2 million gallons of fuel oil wow. a year. So imagine it's a million gallons of fuel oil. That we don't, as you said, you don't have to trans, you know, extract, transport, and all the sort of energy embedded into bringing it to Puerto Rico. Um, you know, Gulf Coast. You can think of all these things that you know we're, we're not participating in. And we're participating less in all that. Uh, I told you about the compost uh, element of it, uh, which is all the sludges coming right. from different systems. Um, there's also um, irrigation of the water as it's done. So the idea here is that there is no, no. It's a closed loop, and that's that's been the guiding. That are principle is let's close all the loops uh, on this process. You know, one of our, we've been, Mike and I have been so blessed to have so many wonderful guests just like you who are doing amazing things, amazing things with 
uh, wonderful, legendary brands around the world. And one of our great guests was Barton Alexander. And Barton Alexander was uh, the chief sustainability officer, still is, of course, over in uh, Colorado. And what we learned from him, Roberto, is that yeah, as much as we do, there's always so much to do. And this is really just a wonderful process that keeps moving forward. In the seven years, if we were to cut off the seven years of your journey so far, what has been the best and the, 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 the most, uh, like say, the green initiative that you've been most proud of to date? Yeah, I, I think it has to be this whole sort of, um, you know, wastewater to energy thing. I mean, the whole idea, I mean, when you think about energy in general, you know, and everybody, all our listeners are, are very, I'm sure, very, you know, keen to it, is, you know, energy is sort of the driving force just about so many things, not only issues of climate change, et cetera, there's geopolitics, there's all this stuff sort of associated with energy. So any way you can make your own energy uh, locally by cleaning a byproduct, I think that's the one that I feel the most proud of. But, you know, one of the things for the listeners is that, you know, we always think of, of sustainability. It's like, I want to be sustainable It's as a destination. Right. And I think the sustainability is a process. It's, it's sort of something we just, we constantly do. And as you say, um, it, it, you can never finish. You know, it, you never fin- there's never a destination in sustainability. You just, it's not how you get better and better and better at doing it because there's something else we can do better. Right, right. And, you know, w- with regards to that, you know, so many people that we talk with or potential people that want to come on the show, they always share with us the same story. They're always worried. They were always scared before they put the first step forward to really start their sustainability movement at their company to really start the culture and kickstart it because they're always worried about cost. They're worried about negative attention or negative media. Talk a little bit about what what this really costs to your family company. Now, here's an amazing family brand, you know, for all these years doing the number one brand in Puerto Rico, the pride of the country, and a brand that's known around the world. How much was this investment? You came in, you were the new kid on the block, the sixth generation. How much investment did your family have to make to get this green operation up and going? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's an interesting one. I had uh, plenty of board uh, room uh, discussions around it. But uh, it, it was, um, you know, at the end of the day, the total investment we did on the operation is close to $15 million. Um, so it is a big number, I mean, wow. in, in any league. Uh, and obviously for people who are kind of considering, so what, what, why can I, you know, what do I have to be, you know, what can I do to be sustainable? I don't have to carry the capital. How do, sure. I, how do I approach it? Sure. You know, it's one of those things where, you, I mean, Obviously, if there's anything, the, the, the win-wins are the ones that actually make it worthwhile. Uh, and, and some of these things, you know, environmental uh, solutions will become even more um, uh, prevalent as they become economical solutions, too. And that's the marriage. You know, I, 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 you know I, I've read some of the stuff that, you know, Paul Hawken and all those, some of that stuff that, sure. sort of, you know, ecology of commerce and all that stuff. It's this whole notion of how we marry those two things. There's always a benefit that we can get economically. Because at the end of the day, you know, business is to, to you know, increase shareholder value. That's sort of why we're in business. You know, people That's right. put their money in and they, they, they value what we do, but at the same time, we've got to put a return. Um, and I think one of the things that, that will start coming is these things like carbon credits, things of this nature that start to build a value to those intangibles that we are, in fact, improving. Because when you think about the carbon embedded in, in, my, in my, my, you know, uh, cubic feet of, of methane that I'm bringing into my boiler, there's so much less carbon than, than the, the fuel oil gallon that I'm, that I'm not bringing. So there should be a credit for the person that's actually doing that to, to balance the economics of it, because that's, that's at the end of the day what's going to happen. So I see a lot of good movement in those directions, I mean, and I think there's a lot of investments right now for this kind of, um, uh, you know, some grants, federal grants, and, right. and that kind of stuff. You just have to find in order to, to, to reduce your capital costs. But at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about uh, doing the right thing. You're going to be ahead of your competitors because they're going to have to do it eventually. Right. Well, what and, you know, you, you can, you, there's a lot of value. I mean, consumers right now, they're really in tune with, with what the brands that they buy and they, they, they engage in, what they stand for. Right. And if, you're, if you can make a brand that stands for something really beautiful and you're doing the right thing, people will embrace you. And I think, you know, consumers, 
much more into into values now than they used to be in the past. You know, you're so right, and that's why Mike and I do this show because we're here to highlight great people like you and great brands like your family's brand, Don Q Rum, that are doing the right thing, that are walking the walk. But now, ha- let's have a little fun. This today is the big day of the board meeting, and you're walking into that board meeting. You're the new kid on the block, and I'm your either your grandpa or your aunties and your uncles, not your mom or dad, but one of you know other family members. And you, and this is the day that you've got to convince us to spend the 15 million. How did that conversation go? How how did your, what was your conversation like in that kind of boardroom? You know, what was the, what are they asking you? ROI? Why do we got to spend this? How did that go down? And how did you explain the ROI to them uh, on a hard basis, which is what families usually typically ask on a hard basis, rather than on the, on, on the soft benefits, which we all know are really true and really growing? Well, that's, that's funny because I had that conversation. And it, it was an unpleasant, I mean, it was a challenging conversation. Sure. At the end of the day, what it really was about was basically about capacity. Okay. Right now, we had a set number of acres that we could put our wastewater. And we had a really big client, um, still do, that was buying huge amounts of rum from us. Okay. And it was to the point that if it rained a lot, we had to stop production. So basically, I needed something to deal with my wastewater so that I could actually um, uh, produce more. And it, I wouldn't be to the vagrancies of rain, literally. Um, ah. So that capacity factor did a huge... There huge impact go. in in the ROI. It wasn't quantified, yep. but basically said, "Look, I can actually improve our our production days from say 200 last year. We can actually do 300 days. 100 days additional, we can do another four million proof counts. Four million proof counts will produce uh, you know a profit of you know 12 million dollars. So it was along those things that you have to kind of look at the ancillary elements. And I just that was one of the issues that I was we were grappling with was it was a capacity thing." On top of it, then there was the savings in fuel oil and all the other sort of soft things that we just discussed. But but that was one of the things that really helped that conversation that particular day. Well, you know, that's that's such an honest and a great answer because as we're looking at these issues here of sustainability, that the three main tenets of sustain of sustainability, people, planet, and profits. You you know, everybody's proposition is always different, and what's important to some people is not important to others with regards to where they sit in, in a company's food chain. So that's why you know it's always fascinating to know how. Who's the champion, and how did they get it across the finish line? Obviously, you were the champion, and it's always fascinating and actually a learning experience for all of us. It's a teaching moment to understand how you got it across the finish line at your family company. Yeah, you know, no, it was it was it was one of those things that it is like that. But it, I mean, when you look at, at the solutions, just look at all the elements around it. And I think that you'll you know find plenty of benefits that that justify those those uh, those decisions. You know, let's talk about the Great Island that you're on, Puerto Rico, and 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 how does this all of these amazing green initiatives that your family and you have undertaken with your brand Don Q Rum? How is it affected? What's the domino effect to the island and the people of Puerto Rico? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically, I, I feel happy that we have to import one million less gallons of fuel oil. Yeah. And all the risks associated with that. We have beautiful beaches. We have beautiful, uh, you know, it's a beautiful island. It really is. And uh, so I'm feeling happy about that impact. I'm feeling happy about the additional, you know, I created 10 additional jobs with this whole wastewater treatment and composting operation. Right. And we're looking to, to expand that. So uh, those are, you know, very tangible ones. Um, we are also, you know, we're doing our little part. We, it's this little section, this little, you know, little corner in our little corner of the world. We are trying to close the loops. You know, we're, we're trying to reduce any uh, any waste, uh, turning all our waste into something useful. Like, you know, it used to be, you know, raw wastewater. Now it's irrigation grade water. Uh-huh. Um, so all those things is what uh, what we're doing here for Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, you know, being an island, um, you know, it's uh, you have a particular ri- uh, you know challenges, and one of them actually is solid waste. Mm. So I'm feeling really good about the fact a that the sludges don't end up in the landfill. And B that I'm 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 diverting a whole bunch of pallets and wood and stuff to ending at a landfill, just by doing this sort of composting, sort of reusing. We don't make a lot of money in it because we're in the business of making rum. But hey, you know, we we make a tiny little bit and helps right. helps the whole operation and it just it, it makes it happen. Um, so that's that those, those would have to be you know some of the the, the main benefits that that we're getting. Hey, so you've become now the. Mm, not only you're one of the leading brands of rum in the world, but now you're probably the leading brand of rum leading the green revolution forward. How many other of your competitors or folks in the distillery industry have now come to you and said, hey, Roberto, 
help a brother out. Tell us, tell us what you know and how do we do this. How many are resistant and how many are following your paradigm that you've created? It's, uh, it's that, you know, that actually has been very um, exciting in some ways. It's still, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, in the back end, when you start in the back end of the business, not the marketing side, but in the back end, we actually, I, I, you know, we have a lot of good relationships with other producers because sure. their problems are similar to my problems. So they have a solution. I sh- we share a lot of information. Um, in reality, uh, as, as, you know, being pioneers in this, there is a new distillery being built in the USVI by a large multinational. Um, and they are using exactly, in fact, they're using the project manager that, that built our operation to build their new state-of-the-art wastewater treatment. So I'm feeling pretty good that, you know, all of, all of that that we created here is going to be recreated in the USVI. Uh, and there's plenty of people, you know, from all over the world. Venezuela, we have people visit us from India, you know, visit us from all over the world, uh, Dominican Republic, looking at what we're doing to try to understand and how they can recreate it in their place. I'm feeling pretty good about that ripple effect. Um, you know, it's one of those things where you can be kind of jealous and you can hold it in or you can realize, you know what, this is, this is fine. This is it, this is uh, it's it's all good, you know. It's uh, you share the good, you know, because uh, it's uh, why why hold it too close, you know. It's well, shared, I'm- you're right. You know that's why we do the show because you know if the ocean goes up, all the boats on the ocean go up, and we all live on this one planet together. So we agree, sharing the information and democratizing the great information and the great paradigms that are created by families like yours and people like you is what this is all about. That's why Mike and I do this show. You know, we're down to the last couple minutes here or so, and I, I want you to just share a couple things here, two things. What's next in line? You know, seven years are behind you, but, you know, you're a young man and there's a lot to do in front of you. What are the next two or three major initiatives of sustainability in front of you at Don Q Rum? And next, also, speak a little bit about your journey. There's a lot of young people out there listening to our show around the world, actually, besides the United States, around the world. And they want to become the next Roberto Serias. How does that work? What What do they do? Yeah. So, they, uh, you know, it's funny because uh, that you know one of the things that you know as I started in the back end, you know, basically set up your processes right, and that's that's the one thing that you know that that makes the most sense because it is the process itself of building whatever you're building, whether it's bicycles or or bottles of rum. Make it make it right. Make it make it green. Um, so that that I feel we're getting very close. Um, I, I next step for me is going to be materials. You know, we basically, you know, we sell rum, but we also sell materials. We also sell, uh, you know, basically a lot of packaging and all that stuff. So that's the next step that I'm looking into. How do we actually integrate into all that, make recyclable materials, uh, you know, buy recyclable um, materials and make them sort of also recyclable? Um, and, um, you know, in general, those are the, the, the main, that's the, my name, my next focus. Um, but I think the, 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 the sort of the message here is to, to anybody is that there's a lot of opportunities out there. And we just have to find our niche. Um, but whatever you do, do it with integrity. Do it with, with a lot of love and a lot of care. Because at the end of the day, that's really what's going to drive you. You're going to be happy. And your family's going to be happy. And then at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's what you take home, you know. The love you make is equal to the love we make. No, the love we take is equal to the love you make. I love it. I love it. Well, <laughs> Roberto, you are going to always be invited. You have an open invitation as you continue the journey at Don Q Rum to come back on Green is Good and share the love with our listeners because uh, you, we're just so honored to have you on and, and, and thank your family for us, for all the great work they're doing. For our listeners out there, please go to Roberto's beautiful website. It's the best rum.com out there, www.don.com. Q.com. Roberto, Dr. Roberto Sarias, you are a visionary ecopreneur and truly living proof that green is good.